I want to open by quoting uh, Einstein's wonderful statement, just so people will feel at ease that the great scientist of the 20th century also agrees with us and also calls us to this action. He, he said, a human being is a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness, that separation. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion, to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. This insight of Einstein's is uncannily close to that of Buddhist psychology, wherein compassion, karuna it is called, is defined as the sensitivity to another's suffering and the corresponding will to free the other from that suffering. It pairs closely with love, which is the will for the other to be happy, which requires, of course, that one feels some happiness oneself and wishes to share it. This is perfect in that it clearly opposes self-centeredness and selfishness to compassion, the concern for others. And further, it indicates that those caught in the cycle of self-concern suffer helplessly, while the compassionate are more free and implicitly more happy. The Dalai Lama often states that compassion is his best friend. It helps him when he is overwhelmed with grief and despair. Compassion helps him turn away from the feeling of his suffering as the most absolute, most terrible suffering anyone has ever had, and broadens his awareness of the sufferings of others, even of the perpetrators of his misery and the whole mass of beings. In fact, suffering is so huge and enormous, his own becomes less and less monumental, and he begins to move beyond his self-concern into the broader concern for others. And this immediately cheers him up as his courage is stimulated to rise to the occasion. Thus, he uses his own suffering as a doorway to widening his circle of compassion. He is a very good colleague of Einstein's, we must say. Now, I want to tell a story, which is a very famous story in the Indian and Buddhist tradition of the great Saint Asanga, who lived a uh, contemporary of Augustine in the West and was sort of like the Buddhist Augustine. And Asanga lived 800 years after the Buddha's time, and he was discontented with the state of people's practice of the Buddhist religion in India at that time. And so he said, I'm sick of all this. Nobody's really living the doctrine. They are talking about love and compassion and wisdom and enlightenment, but they are acting selfish and pathetic. So the Buddha's teaching has lost its momentum I know the next Buddha will come a few thousand years from now, but exists currently in a certain heaven. That's Maitreya. So I'm going to go on a retreat, and I'm going to meditate and pray until the Buddha Maitreya reveals himself to me and gives me a teaching or something to revive the practice of compassion in the world today. So he went on this retreat, and he meditated for three years, and he did not see the future Buddha Maitreya, and he left in disgust. And as he was leaving, he saw a man sitting, funny little man, sitting sort of part way down the mountain, and he was, had a lump of iron, and he was rubbing it with a cloth. And he became interested in that. He said, well, what are you doing? And the man said, I'm making a needle. And he said, that's ridiculous. You can't make a needle by rubbing a lump of iron with a cloth. And the man said, really? And he showed him a dish full of needles. So he said, oh, OK, I get the point. He went back to his cave. He meditated again. Another three years, no vision. He leaves again. This time, he comes down. And as he's leaving, he sees a bird making a nest on a cliff ledge. And where it's landing to bring the twigs to the cliff, its feathers brushes the rock. And it had cut the rock in inches, six to eight inches in. There was a cleft in the rock by the brushing of the feathers of generations of the birds. So he said, all right, I get the point. He went back. Another three years. Again, no vision of Maitre after nine years. And he again leaves. And this time, he sees water dripping, making a giant bowl in the rock where it drips in the stream. And so he, again, he goes back. And after 12, there is still no vision. And he's freaked out. And he won't even look left or right to see any encouraging vision. And he comes to the town. He's a broken person. And there in the town, he's approached by a dog 
who comes like, eh, like this, one of these terrible dogs you can see in some poor country, even in America, I think, in some areas, and he's looking just terrible. And he becomes interested in this dog because it's so pathetic and it's trying to attract his attention. And he sits down looking at the dog, and the dog, whole hindquarters are a complete open sore. And it is just, some of it is like gangrenous, and there's like maggots in the flesh, and it's terrible. And he thinks, what can I do to fi clean and fix up this dog? Well, at least I can clean it, just wound and wash it. And so he takes it to some water he's about to clean. And then his awareness focuses on the maggots. And he sees the maggots, and the maggots are kind of looking a little cute, and they're maggoting happily in the dog's hindquarters there. And Well, if I clean the dog, I'll kill the maggots. So how can that be? That's an, I'm a useless person, and there's no Buddha, and no Maitre, and everything is all hopeless. And now I'm going to kill some maggots. Then it's no, so he had a brilliant idea. And he took a founder's shard of something, and he cut a piece of flesh from his thigh. And he placed it on the ground. He was really not really thinking too carefully about the ASPCA. <laughs> he was just immediately caught with the situation. So he thought, I will take the maggots and put them on this piece of flesh, then clean the dog's wound, and then you know, I'll figure out what to do with the maggots. So he starts to do that. He can't grab the maggots. Apparently, they wriggle around. They're kind of hard to grab, these maggots. So he says, well, I'll put my tongue on the dog's flesh. And then the maggot will jump on my warmer tongue. The dog is kind of used up. And then I'll spit them one by one down on the thing. So he goes down, and he's sticking his tongue out like this. And he has to close his eyes. It's so disgusting, and the smell, and the thing, and everything. And then suddenly, there's like a, ping, a noise like that. He jumps back. And there, of course, is the future Buddha Maitreya in a beautiful vision, like rainbow lights, a golden jewel plasma body, like exquisite mystic vision he sees. And he's, oh, he's like, he bows. But being human, he's immediately thinking of his next complaint. So as he comes up from his first bow, he says, my lord, I'm so happy to see you, but where have you been for 12 years? What is this? And Maitreya says, I was with you. Who do you think was making needles and making nests and dripping on rocks for you, Mr. Dense, <laughs> looking for the Buddha person, he said. And, uh, and he said, you didn't have until this moment real compassion. And until you have real compassion, you cannot recognize love. Maitreya means love. It's the loving one you know, in, in Sanskrit. And so he looked very dubious, Asanga did. And he said, if you don't believe me, just take me with you. And so he took the Maitreya and sh shrunk into like a globe of ball, took him on his shoulder. And he ran to the town and mark to the marketplace. And he said, rejoice, rejoice. The future Buddha has come ahead of all predictions. Here he is. And then pretty soon they started throwing rocks and stones at him. It wasn't Chautauqua. It was some other town. Because they saw a demented-looking, scrawny-looking yogi man, like some kind of hippie, with a bleeding leg and a rotten dog on his shoulder, shouting that the future Buddha had come. So naturally, they chased him out of town. But on the edge of town, one elderly lady, a charwoman in a charnel ground, saw a jeweled foot on a jeweled lotus on his shoulder and then the dog. But she saw the jeweled foot of the Maitreya, and she offered a flower. So that encouraged him. And he went to Maitreya with Maitreya, then took him to a certain heaven, the way the Buddhist myth unfolds in a typical way. And Maitreya then kept him in that heaven for five years, dictating to him five complicated tomes of the methodology of how you cultivate compassion. And then I thought I would share with you what that method is, or one of them, famous one. It's called the sevenfold causal method of developing compassion. And it begins first by one meditating and visualizing with one, all beings are with one. And all, even all animals too, but everyone is in human form. The animals are in one of their human lives. The humans are human. And then in them, you think of your friends and loved ones, the circle at the table. And you think of your enemies, and you think of the neutral ones. And then you try to say, well, the loved ones I love, but you know, after all, they're nice to me. I had fights with them. Sometimes they were unfriendly. I got mad. Brothers can fight. Parents and children can fight. So in a way, I like them so much because they're nice to me. My the neutral ones, I don't know them. They could all be just fi fine. And then the, un the enemies I don't like because they're mean to me. But they, they are nice to somebody. I could be them. And then the Buddhists, of course, think, because we've all had infinite future lives, the Buddhists think that we've all been each other's relatives, actually. And everyone, therefore, all of you in the Buddhist view, in some previous life, although you don't remember it, and neither do I, have been my mother 
for which I do apologize for the trouble I caused you. And also, actually, I've been your mother. I've been female, and I've been every single one of yours mother in a previous life, the way the Buddhists reflect. So my mother in this life is really great, but all of you, in a way, are part of the eternal mother. You gave me that question, the eternal mama, you said. That's wonderful. So that's the way the Buddhists do it. A theist, a Christian, can think that, we're all, that all beings, even my enemies, are God's children. So in that sense, we're related. And then, so they first create this foundation of equality. So we sort of reduce a little the clinging to the ones we love, it, just in the meditation. And we open our mind to those we don't know, and we definitely reduce the hostility, and I don't want to be compassionate to them, to the ones we think of as the bad guys, the ones that we hate and we don't like, and we don't hate anyone, therefore. So we equalize, that's very important. And then the next thing we do is what is called mother recognition. And that is, we think of every being as familiar, as family. We expand, we take the feeling about remembering a mama, and we diffuse that to all beings in this meditation. And we see the mother in every being. We see that look that the mother has on their face. It's looking at this child that is a miracle that she has produced from her own body, being a mammal, where she has true compassion, truly is the other, and identifies completely. Often the life of that other will be more important to her than her own life. And that's why it's the most powerful form of altruism. The mother is the one is the model of all altruism for, for human beings, for, for in, in, in spiritual traditions. And so we reflect until we can sort of see that motherly expression in all beings. People laugh at me because, you know, that I used to say that I used to meditate on Mama Cheney as my mom, when, of course, I was annoyed with him about all of his evil doings in, the, in, the, in Iraq. I used to meditate on George Bush. He's quite a cute mom in a female form. He has his little ears, and he smiles, and he rocks you in his arm, and you think of him as nursing you. And then Saddam Hussein, serious mustache is a problem, but you think of him as a mom. And this is the way you do. You take any being looks sort of weird to you, and you see how they could be familiar to you. And you do that for a while, and then, then you get until you really feel that. You can feel the familiarity of all beings. Nobody seems alien. They're no other. You reduce the feeling of otherness about beings. Then you move from there to remembering the kindness of mothers in general. If you can remember the kindness of your own mother, if you can remember the kindness of your spouse, or if you are a mother yourself, how you were with your children, and you begin to get very sentimental. You cultivate sentimentality intensely. You will even weep, perhaps, with gratitude and kindness. And then you connect that with your feeling that everyone has that motherly possibility. Every being, even the most mean-looking one, can be motherly. And then you third, you step from there to what is called a feeling of gratitude. You want to repay that kindness that all beings have shown to you. And then the fourth step, you go to what is called lovely love. And each one of these, you can take some weeks or months or days, depending on how you do it, or you can do them in a run, this meditation. And then you think of how lovely beings are when they are happy, when they're satisfied. And every being looks beautiful when they're internally feeling a happiness. Their face doesn't look like this. When they're angry, they look ugly, every being. But when they're happy, they look beautiful. And so you see beings in their potential happiness, and you feel a love toward them that you want them to be happy, even the enemy. And actually, it's very logical to want... We think Jesus is being unrealistic when he says, love thine enemy. He does say that. And we think he's being unrealistic and sort of spiritual and highfalutin. It's nice for him to say it, but I can't do that. But actually, that's practical. If, you're, if you love your enemy, that means you want your enemy to be happy. If your enemy was really happy, why would they bother to be your enemy? How boring to run around chasing you. They would be relaxing somewhere, having a good time. So it makes sense to want your enemy to be happy because they'll stop being your enemy because that's too much trouble. So but anyway, you, you, that's a lovely love. And then finally, the fifth step is compassion, universal compassion. And that is where you then look at the reality of your, all the beings that you can think of. And you look at them, and you see how they are, and you realize how unhappy they are, actually, mostly, most of the time. You see that furrowed brow in people, and that you realize they don't even have compassion on themselves. They're driven by this duty and this obligation. I have to get that. I need more, and I'm not worthy, and I should do something. And they're rushing around all stressed out. 
and they don't even, and they, they think of it as somehow macho, hard discipline on themselves, but actually they are cruel to themselves. And of course they are cruel and ruthless toward others, and they then never get any positive feedback. And the more they succeed and the more power they have, the more unhappy they are. And this is where you feel real compassion for them. And you then feel you must act. And it's the motivation that, in the devil, and the choice of action, of course, hopefully will be more practical than poor Asanta, who was doing, fixing the maggots and the dog, but we, because he had that motivation, and whoever was in front of him, he wanted to help. But of course, that is impractical. He should have founded the ASPCA in the town and gotten some scientific help for dogs and maggots. But, and I'm sure he did that later. But, <laughs> but uh, that, that just indicates the state of mind. You know? And so the next step, the sixth step beyond universal compassion, which then is this thing where you're linked with the needs of others in a true way, and you have compassion for yourself also, and you don't, it isn't sentimental only, you might be fierce with some, some bad guy is making himself more and more unhappy being more and more mean to other people and getting punished in the future for it in various ways. And in the Buddhism, they catch it in the future life. Of course, in, in theistic religions, they're punished by God or whatever. In materialism, they think they get out of it just by not existing, by dying, but they don't. And so they get reborn as whatever, you know. Never mind, I won't get to that. But the next step is called universal responsibility. And that is very important. The charter of compassion must lead us to develop through true compassion what is called universal responsibility. And that means that that's the great teaching of His Holiness the Dalai Lama that he always teaches everywhere. And that he says that is the common religion of humanity, kindness. But kindness means universal responsibility. And that means whatever happens to other beings is happening to us. And we are responsible for that. And we should take it and to do whatever we can at whatever little level and small level that we can do it. We absolutely must do that. There is no way not to do it. And then finally, that leads to a new orientation in life where we live equally for ourselves and others. And we realize that happiness for ourselves, and we are joyful and happy. One thing we mustn't think is that compassion makes you miserable. Compassion makes you happy. The first person who is happy when you get great compassion is yourself. Even if you haven't done anything yet for anybody else, although the change in your mind already does something for other beings, they can sense this new quality in yourself. And it helps them already and gives them as an example. And that uncompassionate clock has just showed me that it's all over. So <laughs> practice compassion, read the charter, disseminate it, and develop it within yourself. Don't just think, oh, well, I'm compassionate or I'm not compassionate, and sort of think you're stuck there. You can develop this. You can diminish the non-compassion, the cruelty, the callousness, the neglect of others, take universal responsibility for them, and then not only will God smile and this eternal mama will smile, but Karen Armstrong will smile. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>